Welcome to Shankaraya's Editorial Analysis. Shankaraya's Academy is going to conduct a prelims test series known as pre-storming which consists of almost 48 tests. You can enroll in this test series by clicking the link given below in the description. So today's, today's topic of discussion is these three editorials which are taken from October 6th and 7th newspaper. So in the first editorial we will discuss about the PM internship scheme and what are the challenges in the implementation of the policies and what are the strategies which are undertaken by the government to address these challenges. And in the second editorial we will see about the recent Hamas and Israel conflict and what can be the role of India to address this challenge in the region. And third we have a editorial called as the defeat foretold. In this we will see about the moism in India especially in the underdeveloped region and what are the strategies undertaken by the government of India to face the rise of moism. So without further delay let us get into today's discussion. Look at this editorial taken from the newspaper The Hindu. So let us understand what is the context of the editorial first. A new scheme called as the PM intention scheme is going to be started as a pilot project in the coming December with almost 1.25 lakh interns. The main aim of this scheme is to provide a year long on the job training to the unemployed youth which will bridge the gap between the education and the practical skills. With the close monitoring of the outcomes and the challenges like the local placements and skill integration, the scheme will be eventually expanded. This is the context of the editorial. With this editorial, let us take a look at what is the PM intention scheme. We also have a topic in the GS2 governance that is government policies and the intervention and what are the issues arising out of the design and implementation. We will use this concept as a base to understand that topic. So, let us start with the main question. The effectiveness of a public policy depends on the overcoming challenges at each stage of its formation. This is the quote given here or a statement given here. We have to discuss the major challenges which are faced in the public policy formation process in India and we have to suggest the strategies to overcome. So, we have two parts to be addressed in this question. First is the challenges and second is the measures or the strategies to overcome that. Starting with the PM intention scheme, this scheme was launched in the year 2024 which will address the employability of India's youth. So, how they will address the employability? They will provide a year-long training for almost 1 crore participants by the year 2029. So, this scheme will connect the intern with the companies and equip them with the practical skills which is required for the job. The first batch is going to start in the December month of 2024. They will monitor the dropout rates, regional challenges and skill development integration during the pilot phase. So, this initiative is very important because it will enhance the youth employability. But the major challenge or the hurdle in this scheme is to align the internships with the industries because there is only less industrialized region in India. So, as already said, we will see what are the challenges in the formation of a public policy in India. First is the agenda setting. With respect to that, we have a political prioritization. Usually, political agendas will overshadow the crucial issues such as the infrastructure development, the environmental concerns that need much attention. For example, even though the environmental concern and it is very urgent, it is usually overshadowed by the political and economic priorities. This leads to delay in the policies addressing the air pollution. So, this is one of the example where the political concerns are overshadowing the economic concerns. Talking about the public awareness, usually there is a limited participation from the marginalized communities such as the SCs, STs and the women. This leads to inadequate representation of their issue. Let us take an example to understand this. In many tribal areas, the basic needs like access to clean drinking water are often neglected because they do not have a voice in a platform to show their concern. And next is the policy formulation step. So, here we have a challenge called as the lack of data. Data quality and collection gaps often lead to poorly informed policies. 
For example, in urban planning policies, we used to ignore the informant settlements because we do not have a adequate data. This will in turn delay the efforts to address the urban poverty. Another issue with respect to the policy formulation is the stakeholders involvement. Usually, the marginalized groups lack the representation in case of the policy decision. For example, during the formulation of the Farms Act in the year 2020, the farmers were not consultant, which in turn led to widespread protest and next is the policy adoption after the policy formulation. In this, we have a political consensus, which is nothing but to gain the consensus across various political parties and the stakeholders will be very difficult. For example, in case of the Women Reservation Bill, it took many years to pass because of the political disagreement between various political parties. We also have the bureaucratic hurdles. Difficult bureaucratic procedures will usually slow down the policy adaptation. Many e-governance initiatives in states face delay because of the slow modernization of the government system and the next step in the public policy formulation is the implementation with respect to in implementation first is the resource allocation many policies face challenges due to lack of financial as well as human resource let's take an example to understand this in case of the national rural health mission because of the underfunding to this mission there was a shortage in the healthcare professional. This in turn affected the reach into the rural areas. And talking about the coordinating issues, there is a poor coordination between government departments which in turn led to the ineffective implementation. The Right to Education Act had inadequate infrastructure and teacher training across the world, across various states. Because of the poor coordination between the government departments, it led to the ineffective implementation. And the final step of the policy formulation is the evaluation. One major challenge is that we have a weak monitoring schemes. Many policies do not have a best monitoring system. This will make the asset harder to assess the impact. For example, in case of the PDS, there is many leakages and corruption because there is no adequate monitoring mechanism. And next is the feedback integration. Getting feedbacks from the policy evaluation is often not incorporated in a timely or a systemic manner. Even though there are many evaluations conducted, there was a huge corruption in the MG Narega scheme. Having seen about the challenges in the policy formulation with, with the five steps such as the agenda setting, policy formulation, the policy adoption, implementation and evaluation. Now we will see what are the strategies which can be adapted to overcome these challenges which are mentioned till now. So, first is the agenda setting. We can use digital platforms such as Facebook, Instagram and media campaigns and community meetings to increase the participation of public. This will raise the awareness among the citizen. And next we can use the data driven prioritization. Under this we are going to use the data analytics and research to identify and to prioritize the critical issues based on the evidence rather than a political convenience. And with respect to the policy formulation, we can strengthen the data collection. So, this can be done by investing in the better data collection system to ensure there is a regular update to support the informed policy decision. We can also create platform to engage the marginalized society to ensure their issues are considered during the designing of the policy. We can use strategies like the mediation and the conflict resolution to build a consensus among the political parties and the stakeholders. This will strengthen the policy adoption. As we already mentioned, there is a difficult bureaucratic process. We, we can simplify the procedures by using the digital tools to reduce the delay which will enhance the efficiency of the process. And the fourth step, as already said, is the implementation of the public policy. This issue can be solved by allocating sufficient financial and human resources for the policy implementation. Training programs can be conducted for officials and better budget can be allotted. We can also improve the coordination by using interdepartmental task force and technology which will enhance the coordination among the different government levels and agencies. 
and with respect to the last step evaluation, we can use real time data and digital tools to track the outcomes of the policy. So, this will improve the monitoring mechanism as there is a poor monitoring mechanism right now in certain cases. We can also enhance the feedback integration by regularly reviewing the policies and integrating the feedback from the evaluation to refine as well as to improve the policy execution. So, in this editorial, we discussed about the GS2 important topic that is issues arising out of design and implementation of a government policy. So, we discussed what are the challenges with respect to the formulation of the public policy at each step we divided the policy formation into five step and list out the challenges. We also discussed what are the measures or strategies to overcome these challenges. With this, we will conclude the discussion on this editorial and now let us move on to the next one. Look at this editorial, we are going to discuss about the Moism, which is an important topic under the internal security of the UPSC main syllabus. So, let us try to understand what is the news first and let then let us get to into the discussion. The news is that there is an ongoing moist conflict in India and there is a recent setback for them because many of the moist fighters were killed in a clash with the security forces in the Chhattisgarh. And in the recent months, more moist have either been killed or have been surrendered to the government because the government's operation has been intense in the recent months. One of the main reasons for the decline in the moist movement is that the tribal communities who once supported them are now losing the interest and they are no longer going back because there is so this is the context of the editorial which they have discussed in this with this let us try to understand what is the basics of the moism and what are the causes for the rise of moism we will also see what are the challenges in defeating the moist and what are the strategies undertaken by the government against them let us start with the main question. Critically evaluate the government's measure in addressing the moist issue. We have to focus both on the security and the development perspective. This is the demand of the question. Let us understand basics about the moism first. This is also known as the Naxalite movement, which many may, might have heard in the news. The origin of this moism goes back to the year 1967 in the West Bengal. It started as a Naxalbari uprising. So, this Moism was inspired by an ideology known as the Mao Zedong ideology which says that they used armed revolution among the rural poor, particularly the tribal people and the landless farmers against the landlords and the state. This is the actual ideology of that movement which is the inspiration for the Moism or the Naxalite movement in India. So, this movement initially started as a peasant revolt but it soon spread to the other regions, particularly to the underdeveloped tribal areas. This is the basics of the Moism. It is nothing but a armed rebellion against the landlord basically happened in the underdeveloped tribal region. So, the key words will be underdeveloped, armed rebellion. These are the key words or the key ideologies for the Moism. This is the reason for the Moism. And now we will see what is the causes of the rise of Moism. First is the socio-economic inequality. As already said, the Moism happens in the underdeveloped region. Usually, the tribal and the rural population are affected by the Moism because they have facing poverty, illiteracy and uh, lack of basic infrastructure for a long period of time. So, this inequality has created a resentment among them against the state. And this resentment was used by the or exploited by the Moist. This is the first reason for the rise of Moism in India. And second is the displacement. When large scale industrial or mining projects happened in India such as in the Jark and Chhattisgarh, Odisha, this led to the displacement of the local communities. Because of the displacement, it led to the rise of the Moist movement because they had no place to live because they were not compensated or rehabilitated by a government in a better situation. This was another fuel for the rise of Moism. And next is the failure of governance. The inefficiency or the neglect by the local government to address their basic needs such as education, health care, employment increased the frustration among the tribal people. 
and this led to the rise of Moism as well because there is a existence of corruption, inefficiency in the government. This created a resentment among them against the government. And the fourth reason is the exploitation of resources. Usually, these regions were rich in the natural resources such as forest, coal and minerals. They were populated by the tribal communities. Because of the exploitation of these resources by the corporate and the MNCs, the local communities had only minimal benefits. And these also led to the Moist influence. So, you can understand that the major reason for the Moism was the underdevelopment or the inequality among them. So, this led to the rise of Moism. The underlying reason for everything was the underdevelopment. Now, we will see what are the challenges in defeating the Moist. We will see in three aspects, namely the geographical terrain, why there is a popular support in the remote areas and the economic underdevelopment. With respect to the geographical terrain, mostly these Moist operate primarily in the forested and hilly regions because they will provide a natural cover by itself. We have seen there is a increased moism in regions like Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand and Orissa which have a dense forest and these dense forests offer an ideal condition for gorilla warfare which is practiced by these moist and this warfare is making difficult for the security forces to eliminate them completely. This is the first challenge with respect to the defeating Moist. And next is the popular support in the remote areas. Even though the Moist support has weakened by the government, they still retain some level of influence in the tribal areas because they have a promise of distributing the land among them and the opposition to industrial exploitation. Because industries led to the displacement of these communities, these promises of the Moist are giving a hope among them. And this is complicating the efforts to completely dismantle their network. And next is the economic underdevelopment. One of the major reasons for the continuing of the Moist influence is the lack of development in the affected areas. Because without addressing the root causes of poverty and inequality, only operating the security operation will not bring a lasting solution. We have to address the root cause which is the development of this affected region and only the development will bring the solution, long term solution. So, to bring this long term solution that is to create a development in this area, what are the steps taken by the government? Let us see one by one. First is the Operation Green Hunt in the year 2009. So, this is a large scale anti moist operation which is conducted by the paramilitary forces such as the CRPF, local police, and the Cobra. The main aim of this operation is to neutralize the moist leadership and fighters through a coordinated attack. And next is the integrated action plan. So, the government introduced this plan particularly for the tribal and the moist affected areas. And the aim of this plan is to address the underdevelopment by improving the infrastructure facilities such as road, school and healthcare facilities. And by improving the infrastructure, we can create the employment which will develop these areas. And the next is we have a policy called a surrender and rehabilitation policy. So, what is this surrender and rehabilitation policy? It is nothing but the central government and the state government implemented this policy particularly for the moist cadres. They will offer the financial aid, occasional training and rehabilitation for these people to rehabilitate from that ideology into the mainstream society. And lastly, we have a strategy which is launched by the Ministry of Home Affairs known as the Samadhan strategy. So, the acronym for this strategy is that smart leadership for S, A for the aggressive strategy, M for the motivation and training, A for actionable intelligence and D for a dashboard based KPIs and H for harnessing the technology and N for no access to financing. You can note down the acronym full form. And the main aim of this strategy is to focus on building a capacity of security forces. This can be done by using technology and we can also do this by cutting off the funding routes to the moist operations. This is the main aim of these strategies, the Samadhan strategy. 
and various development initiatives are also taken by the government such as the aspirational district program. The main aim of this program is to improve the key human development indicators in the most particularly in the districts of the state such as Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh because most of these regions are affected by the moist. We can also use technology such as drone satellite imaging to track as well as to neutralize the moist fighters in the dense forest. So, until now we saw what are the strategies or actions taken by the government to handle the moist affected regions. On the whole, we can conclude that by balancing the security and development, we can address the issue. It is true that military operations are necessary to neutralize moism. But to get a long term solution, we have to address the socio-economic grievances which is the main reason for the insurgency. This can be done by improving the basic facilities such as education, healthcare and the job opportunities in these regions. We can also engage with the tribal leaders and the local communities which will help us to understand the concerns of that community which will help to reduce the moist influence. We can also improve the governance by ensuring that there is a transparency, accountability and efficient delivery of the services in tribal areas. So, the major issue was the corruption and inefficiency of the government. By ensuring the transparency, we can gain the trust of the local population and this will help us to address the influence of the moist. And lastly, by providing educational training for the young people in this region, we can offer them an alternative instead of joining to the insurgency. So, on the whole, by addressing the security as well as the developed challenges, the government can work towards resolving the moist insurgency and bringing the peace to these affected regions. So, in this editorial, we saw what is the basics of the moism, that is, we saw what is the origin of no moism, that is the Naxalbari village in the year 1967 and then we saw what are the reason for that rise of Moism. Then we saw what are the challenges in addressing this Moism. Then we saw what are the strategies to deal with these challenges. With this, we will conclude the discussion on this editorial and now let us move on to the next one. Take a look at this editorial taken from Indian Express newspaper. So, the context of this newspaper article is that recently in this month Hamas has attacked the Israel and this attack has further escalated the situation into severe crisis situation because the global stability and security at risk. So, we all know the major war between the Hamas and the Israel that is taking place for so long now. So, just giving a quick recap of this war. Israel uh, between Israel and Hamas. So, Hamas is nothing but it is a Palestinian military group who are now governing the Gaza Strip. The main root of friction between these two groups is going back to almost 20th century between the Jews and the Arabs in the British ruled Palestine after the creation of Israel in the year 1948. So, after the creation of Israel in 1948, many Palestinians were asked to displaced which led to conflict over the land and identity. So, this is the root cause of the Israel and Hamas war. And if you do not know what is Hamas, actually Hamas is a, a group formed in the year 1987 during the first Palestine uprising against the Israel. It was designated as the terrorist group by Israel, US and European Union. But the main aim of Hamas is the destruction of Israel. They also took the control of Gaza Strip in the year 2007 after they won the election in the Palestine in the year 2006. But after this takeover in the year 2007, Israel imposed a block on the Gaza citing the security reasons. And currently there are various amount of clashes which are occurring between these two countries which are affecting the civilians at most. This is the context of this uh, article which you have to understand the basics first. And now we will see the main question before going into the discussion. First the main question, analyze the implications of the ongoing Middle East conflict especially in the recent Hamas attack on the Israel for the regional stability and global security. In what ways can India contribute to the alleviating the humanitarian as crisis and promoting the peace in this region? This is the question which we are given with. So, 
as already said we have seen the basics of the war and now we will see what is the background of the attack which happened recently so this conflict roots to the regional ethnic and the territorial disputes in this region the tensions are further increased because of the long standing rivalry between the israel israel and iran e along with that the palestinians are also struggling for a statehood which is further intensifying the situation the groups like hamas and hezbollah is gaining a support from the iran and this is seen as a direct threat against the israel security as they are perceiving these groups as threat to their security they are taking military actions which they frame as a national defense and these defense or the military actions taken by the israel is leading to a significant civilian casualties this is the background of the attack now we will see what is the trigger of the attack which happened recently there is an increased israeli military operations in this palestinian region and the hamas has framed the attack as a response to the israeli military raids they also says that settlement expansions are taking place which are against the palestinians this is also a major reasons for the hamas attack on the israel so what is the current situation in the middle east so more than 40000 palestinians have been died in the gaza due to the israeli air strikes and more than 1 lakh palestinian have been injured in the gaza approximately 2 million people in gaza has been displaced so this conflict risks the nature of each other's attack turning into a broader regional war particularly with the iran's involvement and their support for the hezbollah group so one thing you have to understand is that there are many casualties civilian casualties in this attack and all the groups are affected by that and this is leading to a regional war consequently because of the involvement of iran so usually when you are going to read the regional instability it is better you understand the map or the geographical aspect of this region as they might pop up in the prelims question such as what are the countries bordering the countries such as saudi arabia iran iraq that might pop in the question so uh, take a look at this so take a look at this talking about the humanitarian crisis the un report says that there is a severe shortage of basic necessities such as food water and medical supplies in this region and nearly 2 million palestinians have been displaced which is causing a overcrowded shelters and worsening the situation even more because of the inadequate medical care and in lebanon civilians are escaping from their home due to the heavy bombardment and the ground operations which are specifically targeted on the hezbollah which are supported by the iran so in the question we had what can be the role of india to address this situation india have a significant role in the middle east because almost 10 million indians are residing in the gulf region and the economy of india is heavily dependent upon the oil imports from these middle east region the conflict can threaten the regional stability which will disrupt the oil disruption and which will eventually affect the economy of india the humanitarian and the economic damages are the key concern for india with respect to the current conflict so we need a collaboration to moderate the arab states like egypt jordan saudi and uae to conduct a dialogue and peace initiative in this region so on the whole we can conclude that there is a major concern that it can lead to a wider conflict in the upcoming days so it is very important for in nations like india to engage in this proactively so by improving the diplomatic relationship and advocating for a humanitarian consideration we india can play a important role to mitigate the crisis in this region so by mitigating the crisis we can promote a long term stability in this region which will benefit the india as well so with this we'll conclude the discussion on this article we have come to end of today's video if you found the video informative do hit like give your feedback says comment and don't forget to subscribe thank you have a nice day